Exactly. Is this artist really true? Catch it. That's our first mix. Let me try again. Is this artist from Detroit Cash Kid? Yeah. 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 All right. Next answer. The answer is yes. He is from Detroit. His most recent or the top one was on my mama. Oh my mama. Oh my hood. Oh. That's a nice song association. That was pretty good. Okay. And then last question, or not last question, but last question. Yeah. Is this artist from Detroit? Taylor Mike. No. no. Wow. Okay. Keep it Atlanta. Where are they at? He's from Atlanta. He's from Atlanta. I know. I know that. All right. So now you guys can have your index card in the front of you. Grab your pens. Uh, you do not have to share this one out. This is four. I do have to say it's like a lot. Cool. One, if there was an opportunity to win this game, let's see what you did. But the last question is just reflection. How has the commentary in hip hop influenced today's social justice? Positively, negatively, it's a lot of broad things. How has the commentary in hip hop influenced today's social justice? Oh, you want to yes, please, write it on the index cards. You may not have to show these. While you're writing, our uh, faculty director will be coming up. And we'll get started with the more soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have you a bonus question? Yes. Have you a bonus question? Yes. Yeah. Who in this room is a famous. 1990s rap artist that was born here in the city of Detroit. Who hmm. in this room was a famous oh, rap artist? Chaos and Maestro. Viola. There it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I don't believe you. Prove it. Oh, right there. Oh, that's what it is. Stop. <laughs> I want to hear it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. you Thanks to Shaylin, Shaylin, Shelly. And I want to thank you so much, Shaylin, for being a part of the community. It's so much fun to be here. It's so much fun to be here. So, it's not really hard. Okay. And then, I have a question for Shaylin. Before I give you the introduction to the panel, I'm going to be going with this next event to get this together with us, we have a special course. We have Sandy Gilly, the chief of the U.S. Supreme Court, who's been speaking for the last few months. We've been here for a long time, 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 and we've been here for a long time, and we've been here for a long time, and we've been here for a long time. Professor, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And I am not going to take up too much time because I think the thing that we learn as judges, which is the most important thing and the reason why I'm here, is to listen, to really understand what's happening in the community, to understand what the challenges are, to understand what the struggles are, to understand what the difficulties are. And I can tell you a lot of these difficulties, a lot of these challenges arise within the court system. How justice is made out, who gets justice, the way justice is performed, who has access to justice. And I think the thing that is important about this, and the reason why I insist on being here, and it's so funny because my colleague Bush and I live in a car, so we have to be here, but we have to understand. 
we were really dead on the river because it's a step up on the bus. <laughs> so, we don't about that. But the reason that it's important for us to be here is we're going to listen. And we're going to hear what the panel has not to say. And I want to hear what you have to say. And I just want to learn. And at the end of the day, judges on the highest court who are making decisions and determinations that affect everybody's life should be doing a lot more listening and a lot less talking. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the professor, who will go over to me now. And I'm um, here in the middle of if anybody has any questions about the high court, how it operates or how it runs, or if anybody has some feelings that they would like to share, or should I appear or abandon them, we would want to spend some time here that you have to say. But that's a lot of listening to me.
or there were obstacles in the way of the progression of the goals of the criminal justice, I mean, of the civil rights movement. And so when hip hop was born in 1973, five years later, it's in the context of cities that have been stigmatized, demanded, and demonized. And it's a creative response to that political event and the turning of political weapons against brown and black people under the guise of law and order. So of course, then paves the way for the growth of mass incarceration in the 1990s. And so this series of workshops here in the fall, featuring Karen Frazier and Sterling Tolls, really delve into uh, this kind of rich history in Detroit. And out of those discussions, and then as a result of an article that I read, written uh, by Lou Blewin, which appeared in the University of Michigan Dearborn Legacy Magazine, was a in-depth feature on one of our one of our lecturers at University of Michigan Dearborn, one of our lecturers in education, a guy named Colin Mellons. Colin is back there and Colin is going to be our moderator. I'm going to read the first paragraph of that article to explain to you why Quan is the perfect guy to lead this discussion today. 42-year-old Quan Nellums counts himself lucky that his childhood overlapped the golden age of hip-hop. Make a movie based on his teenage years growing up in Detroit in the 90s, which, by the way, he's working on a screenplay for, and you see a lunchroom full of kids pounding out beats on tables and friends circling up in groups to rap or beatbox until the bell called them back to class. And Quan Elms is a guy who took the power of that culture as in its capacity to communicate and turned it into a pedagogy and a tool of education and empowerment. Here at the University of Michigan Detroit Center. Come on up, Quan. talk very loud into this mic and it's not connected to the speakers only because uh, the people online that's watching it won't be able to hear us from the, the house mic that we were using. So can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I am um, going to bring up our um, panelists and um, they'll uh, introduce themselves and then we'll get uh, right into the questions. And so um, Thank you guys for showing up. I'm gonna to have to take my notes out. Give me one second. Okay, so I wanna um, invite up uh, Mr. Teferi Brent from Chaos and Maestro. This is uh, Chaos, he's gonna join us on our panel. You can come on up and have a seat, my brother. All right, we clap it up. Um, yeah, wherever you wanna sit, man. You can sit on the end, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, I wanna bring up uh, Dr. Uh, Kelly Hay, Professor of Communications at Oakland uh, University. 
you come on up. All right. Um, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Rebecca Ferrugio, Ferrugia? Ferrugia, okay. All right. And then I want to also bring up uh, Miss Piper Carter, rapper extraordinaire. So uh, for the panelists, we uh, we all need to uh, we're going to speak in one mic just so that the audience at home can hear us. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to just get started just with a couple preliminary questions just so that the audience can know who's in front of them. So I want to um, I want to start off with a question. First of all, uh, just give us your your name. And why, why are you here today? Like, what, what makes you um, able to speak to this topic today? So we can start with you, uh, Mr. Teferi Brent. Okay, let me show y'all. Good morning. Good afternoon. I don't think... uh, say good morning, good afternoon, and uh, very, very appreciative of uh, Dr. Michelle Alexander coming to... It's not on. It's for the uh, for the internet. <laughs> We're very appreciative of uh, Sister Michelle Alexander, Attorney Michelle Alexander, coming to share with us. So uh, that's always an honor to have her speaking that particular truth uh, on behalf of brothers and sisters who have been marginalized by this country's criminal justice system. Uh, but I am, as you well know, uh, Tafuri Brent, a proud member of Chaos and Maestro, my comrade Jason Wilson, who is my partner. Um, a right hand guy. He's not here. He's only doing what he does. He's doing a lot of good work with black males. So I always want people to be mindful of Jason Wilson, maestro of Cast and Maestro, whenever you see me, because I represent us. It was us, and it was nothing without us being together. So I'm so proud of all the great work that Jason is doing. He does it with Brother the Quam. You guys built a couple of different institutions together. So I'm just proud of, of his great work. So uh, I'm, I'm the proud father of um, uh, Dallas, of Ishara, of uh, Christina, of Landon, right? Uh, that, that's, that's, my, um, that's my greatest, that's my greatest position and title. And of course, Christina, she'll kill me if I didn't mention her name. That's my second, that's my revolutionary baby. But, but um, yeah, I'm here because I, I've done the work, right? Um, I was born into hip hop through the movement. Uh, my 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 greatest hero or heroine is Miss Clementine Barfield from Save Our Sons and Daughters. Of course, we know that she is the co-architect of the urban peace and justice movement. So that is my greatest hero. And it is through Miss Barfield, then through Dr. Earl Henderson, of course, through my pastor, Reverend Dr. Wendell Anthony, for which I humbly serve as his men's minister right now, that I became uh, exposed to a black liberation struggle, black liberation work. So uh, it was at that same time, this would be in the late or mid 80s, that I also became exposed to hip hop and wanted to rap. So it was natural because of my exposure, because of the Kwame Kenyattas and Chokwe Lamomas and, and, and Dr. Gloria House, many of us know as Mama Neb, you know, Cicero Love and uh, Chris Austin, right? And, J and, and James Boggs, of course, and, and, and Mother Boggs. You know, it's because of that exposure that I, my my lens, my view, my perspective of hip hop was formed in such a way where uh, where I was compelled to you know get involved in, in, in social struggle. I mean that was there was really no other option for me. Although my reality was challenged, my mind was there, right? So I think what uh, makes me a good partner in this conversation with all these other wonderful brothers and sisters. It's because uh, since then, for over 30 years, I've been fighting for the liberation, education, and empowerment of Black people. Uh, I've been consistent about it. And I've committed my, my, my life to the liberation, education, and empowerment of African people. And uh, I've done it. I did it in the 80s, and I'm doing it right now to this very day. And I, and I, and I hope and I pray that uh, God is pleased and that my people uh, are pleased with the many great things we've been able to do. And this is what uh, I think qualifies me to be here today. All right. Thank you. By the way, we worked out the mic situation, so we we are on the regular mics now. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelly Hay. Uh, the doctor part is not so important to me. Um, I have an <laughs> academic background for being here, but that's not why I'm here. I'm trained in communication oh. studies, and as an academic, anyone can study hip hop. 
but I didn't know hip hop until I met two women that are really pivotal in Detroit. Shay Howe, anybody know Shay Howe? She is a Jimmy, Jimmy Box, Grace Lee Box, protege. She's been doing the work for her whole life, and she is our mentor. Uh, she was the chair of the Department of Communication at Oakland University when I got, she got us her first hire as chair. And she brought me into Detroit Summer, she brought me into Detroit Freedom School, she brought me into so many networks that I never would have known about. Um, and it's from Detroit Summer and meeting people like Invincible and other people that were very instrumental in that organization that I came to know Detroit hip hop. But before that, I was nothing but a white kid that thought hip hop was hotel, motel, holiday. In 1979, you know, when that came out, I thought I was a down white kid. Um, and of course, that wasn't hip hop. That was that wasn't even a commercial hip hop. That was like an accident. Um, but I didn't know about the South Bronx. I didn't know about Nas. But when Nas did drop Illmatic, I was in grad school. I was in the thick of. Uh, post-colonial theory and the black power movement and it changed my life. I, I Every day I sing One Love in the shower and I'm going to be singing it a lot louder now because Detroit's morning. We just lost a couple people and one of them's about to spend his life in prison and he's somebody I love dearly. So this mass incarceration hip-hop panel is all about life. Mm. Um, and so I'll tell you more when you ask me questions, but I've learned about hip-hop from working with Piper Carter she is the woman that erected, well, that's a wrong word, who, <laughs> who established the foundation, Women in Hip Hop Collective, that was very unique in Detroit for a long time, and I let Piper do her thing, but she embraced us, she invited us in, we spent 10 years with her documenting women in hip hop in Detroit, and it changed my life, and I'm just grateful to be here. Hi, my name is Becca Faruja. I teach with Kelly at OU in the communication department. I do media studies. I'm a popular music scholar. Um, I grew up in Windsor, so I spent my teen years in the 90s hanging out in Detroit at places like St. Andrews Hall, and I wasn't super into hip-hop, really. I was more of a techno kid, so I was going to all those illegal rave parties. Um, but I was always very curious, like what was going on, you know, sort of ships in the night, you know, ghetto tech kind of bridge that hip hop, uh, techno divide. And um, I was so excited to get my job at OU and get to move back here in 2009. And the first thing I did was I wanted to do a project and there must be something going on with women in hip hop here. I don't see it, but it must be here. And the stars align because I opened the, uh, Metro Times, and I saw an ad that said, you know, the foundation, women in hip hop, Tuesday nights at the old Miami. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to go check this out. I went and happened to be the two year anniversary party. So I was like, this is amazing. What's going on here? That's where I met Piper. And uh, I was really nervous. But at the end of the night, I went up to her and I gave him a business card. And I was like, can I interview you? And she's like, about what? And I'm like, about this, I guess. What else do you do? I don't know the many, many things that Piper did and was involved in. And she, I think she's kind of like, yeah, maybe. I'm maybe hoping I'd go away. But I just kept coming back. I invited Kelly to come with me. So we just started showing up every week. And then I got to know Piper and a lot of the other women involved. And uh, Kelly didn't give the title. But basically, all this work culminated in a, in a book published by the University of California Press. A few years back, called Women Rapping Revolution. Uh, I'm like, what do we call it? Hip hop and community building in Detroit. So we were thrilled to get the invite to be here and share with you what we learned uh, throughout this journey. So thanks. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Piper Carter. Um, let me see. I grew up in Detroit, and we were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So then, first of all, I want to give a shout out to everyone that has been a part of Detroit <clears throat> hip hop history, as well as the Black liberation struggle that has come before me. And happy Martin Luther King Day, because I remember we were fighting to get Martin Luther King Day for decades. So, um, and before I get started, Coretta was not. MLK's sidekick. She was very much a revolutionary in her own right. So I just want to say that before I get started. And I also want to give some love to my mentor, who's in right here, one of my mentors, Ozzy Rivera, 
who is a uh, very long-standing activist. I, I'm gonna call him a scholar, although he may not call himself a scholar, but he's got a very deep history and he's one of the people who helped to ground me in uh, bridging the gaps between arts and culture and showing me how to, you know, do this work because he did it way before me. So thank you. Guys. And um, so I grew up on Chaos and Maestro. Uh, we're the same age, but hip hop is funny like that. Like you could grow up on people and you're your peers. Um, I grew up uh, initially over there on Detroit's east side when the Operation Get Down. I don't know if y'all know about Operation Get Down. I, uh, you know, the free uh, chocolate milks and the, the Bobolo milk dance competitions. I used to win them. Yes, I did. I grew up jitting, not to this fast jit music that they have now, 52 in about uh, two weeks. Not gonna see me jit to that. I, we used to jit, jit to like Parliament Funkadelic and um, funk and stuff like that. So I grew up dancing. I um, did like electric boogaloo, um, popping and locking. I wasn't really like a shake and pop girl because my grandma was in the church and was like, whoa. But I was more like the, the jit, like I can still jit now. I work for youth, and the kids are like, jit, what the work jit, ha, 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 ha. But, uh, <laughs> uh, we, but for me, um, Detroit hip hop was a mix of funk and soul and R&B because at the time, rap was not respected. And so um, we were like underground, I guess. It wasn't really like, you know, accepted as, as it is now. So we were like weirdos or something, or it was a whole other thing, you know? Um, so we kind of, so our music was actually like all the like, you know, funk and soul records until the later 80s when it started to like, you know, take off. So anyway, what qualifies me to be here is I'm the same age as hip hop. I grew up in hip hop. When I was young, I used to dance. And first, I told y'all, break dance and popping and locking. But then also, um, I used to rap. I used to be in a little rap group. I, I was a part of Kim Weston. Shouts out to Kim Weston, who was a part of the Motown history. If y'all know with her song, Marvin Gaye. It's too so she, um, had a summer youth program in Detroit that was the whole summer that employed youth, and I was in there. It was called Festival of the Arts. And it taught us how to be professional artists, and we learned from the Motown ilk how to be professional artists. So I danced and I sang. Before that, both my parents are artists. My dad's an actor that was in Hollywood. That's a whole thing. My mom is a dancer. She danced with Clifford Pierce. So I grew up in the arts. My New York side of life, I can tell you about, but I won't go there. But just know that I was outside, as they say, in the uh, the little, you know, in New York is different. We They had like little courtyards, uh, school yards, where you uh, you double dutch or you pop lock in break dance. And I was doing that. But uh, but in Detroit, I was watching the scene religiously and get my dances from there at 6 o'clock. And it's time to rock, you rock, rock, rock. OK, you know what I'm talking about. OK? Um, and also to. Uh, I would say my family, my uncle was one of the executives uh, over there at WGPR. Uh, so my, my mom was, you know, rest in peace, was um, doing PR for um, Mason in 98. And, you know, so my family is very ingrained in the arts and culture community, as well as the black liberation struggle. You know, my uncle, rest in peace, Baba um, Ibn Corey Pitts was one of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And so if you know about that history, you know, but anybody who to me, Detroit is like that, as Chaos told you to start. Tafari told you all, if you grew up in Detroit in the 70s and the 80s, you were naturally in the black liberation struggle. You were a part time Muslim, and you were, uh, I'm gonna say this I'm from the hood, I'm not from the streets. But you kind of hood if you're from Detroit in that very cultural way where you know good mac and cheese or bad mac and cheese. But anyway, I went in the plane there. But oh, oh, but what qualifies me to be here really quickly? I, I moved back to Detroit in 08, take care of my mom, rest in peace. Um, fast forward, purchased a, a commercial building to create um, a space 
for our community. And we had all types of everything there, whether it was the many funeral services that we needed our communities, weddings, um, you know, baby showers for teenagers, but we also had an open mic that I did a, a no misogyny open mic that lasted for about uh, five years. Long story short, the neighbors in Cork Town did not like black people having that much joy or access. So they called the police on us six times and we were harassed at gunpoint with a private police task force that was put together with monies from the uh, Cork Town Business Development Corporation. And we were harassed and the people in our place were harassed and long story short, uh, ended up losing my life savings, $500,000 that I had invested on my own personal savings that took the building from being uh, condemned to up to code to have to be able to have youth and youth programs. We had a, a, a community kitchen, we had a whole youth computer lab. And anyway, long story short, that was very traumatic. And so I can speak to you on many levels about what it means to be hip hop and this oppressive system uh, that we have here. So I'll land the plane then. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I want to get into the the, uh, the next question, just so we can all have a working definition. Uh, what is hip hop? What is it? So I think I think it's important that we distinguish between hip hop and rap, right? So hip hop is that's the broad overall umbrella culture that in, includes a myriad of things: the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you dance, of course, the artistic expressions of hip hop, which my wonderful sister Poplar can can probably write write a dissertation on <coughs> in regards to graffiti and all the other forms of art, uh, physical material art, visual art that comes along with the culture of hip hop. Then, of course, I would say the very substratum of it, um, in addition to the dancing, right, would be, of course, rap. Now, I define rap as revolutionary African culture. That's how I define rap, right? But that's what hip hop is to me, brother. It's the overall culture. And then, of course, at, at the center of it, and I think Sister Piper would, would argue that uh, the, the arts, right, the artistic expression of it, in addition to rap, which is a part of the artistic expression, right, our core and the substratum of, of, of hip hop. Well, I can't speak to this definition or history as an artist, because I am not. I mean, I do some poetry, but that's not how I define myself. So one of the things that, that Bybee Gallery offered us was an inter-element approach to hip hop, right? So you, you didn't say the elements, but you talk about the broader culture, right? So the the visual art, the graffiti art, the beat making, the DJing, the rapping, all those things together plus fashion plus modes of speech. The one of those, that's that did come from you know the English Oxford dictionary. Uh, so so hip hop for me though is about the place where aesthetics mediates the relationship between pleasure and pain because hip hop is about struggle, it's about brokenness, it's about abandonness and having a voice to come out of that. And it comes out in the most funky, beautiful way. Um, it's, but it has its own aesthetic, right? And I think that's one of the things that troubles me about hip hop is people go, oh, it's just a great thing for social critique. But they don't think about the aesthetics themselves of what MCs do, what producers do, what beat makers and DJs do, and the skill sets and the dexterity, all of that. And life is hip hop. And the only thing I'd add to that too is thinking about that fifth element, right? Like knowledge of self and others. And that's kind of what distinguishes uh, the work of the hip hop artists that we got to know and write about in our book, you know, based in like Piper's values and beliefs, uh, associated with the foundation, its connection to the 5D gallery, wanting to be a community space, a place of uplift, getting uh, young people, but all people to really think about those connections between uh, activism, social justice work, what we learned from Piper, cultural organizing, right, to help goes beyond just getting on the stage and just like, you know, Rapping some rhymes or playing some music, uh, things like that. Yeah, <clears throat> the one thing I'll add, I do agree, especially with the cultural definition that you gave. Um, so in 2016, <clears throat> Keith Tucker uh, actually had 
health and wellness inducted as the 10th official element of hip hop. So there's lots of arguments. I know Karis One has the Temple of Hip Hop, but there's uh, nine, and um, a, a person I'm going to keep nameless <laughs> has the five elements. Uh, but uh, I adopt the 10 because of the health and wellness and the need in our community, uh, our world for health and wellness. So I, I, I agree with that cultural definition, uh, magazines, fashion, clothing, uh, like you said, hip hop also is a culture uh, that gave us the courage to be ourselves because of what had gone on with uh, the destruction of our communities. So through arts and culture and basically education being removed from our schools and the destruction of our families and that whole, that whole thing that we went through in the 70s, if you grew up here in Detroit in the 70s and 80s, hip hop was that thing that was like, that's where I see myself, that validates me, you know, I have a voice in that. And I would argue that the culture that we see now kind of comes out of that, that culture of, you know, the black girl magic and, you know, all of that, 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 come, that come, I would argue that that comes out of that tradition. Uh, which leans on the jazz tradition, right? Of coming here and making do, but flipping it into something that is so extraordinary, right? Um, and like you said, we could argue about the commercial factor that the, 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 the record industry, I don't, that's not my hip hop culture. The hip hop culture that Chaos talked about, that we grew up on, that exchange of ideas. And that exchange of talent and that competition, that healthy competition, you know what I'm saying? That's our real culture. I would call that hip hop culture. And, and I want to be clear, right? Because, like with a lot of other things, so, 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 so sorry, not to be funny with this culture face. Uh, but uh, uh, like with a lot of things in this country, you know, we don't want, uh, we don't want hip hop to be commandeered by other folks, right? Hip hop is born out of black culture. It's a subculture within black culture. Now, of course, like every like everything else that we do as black people, which is excellent, beautiful, and wonderful, and magnificent, <laughs> other culture groups, of course, they take hold to it, they love on it, you know, they make their slight adjustments and modifications to reflect their individual subcultural realities. But let's be clear, this is black culture. If it ain't no black folks, it ain't no hip hop. Right. So black folk hip hop was born out of the uh experiential realities right of black life in this country in fact uh it was necessitated right the the, the conditions that our people found themselves in and our struggle necessitated right the creation of hip-hop because it gave us a voice when, when there was no voice right you know so i want to make that very clear it is black culture that's what hip-hop is it's a subculture of black culture now this world is huge Right? It is infiltrated, if you may, many other forms of culture, every other culture, right? I'm saying, but it is indeed a black cultural phenomenon. All right, thank you. Um, um, did you did you guys know there were 10 elements of hip hop? No, no I didn't know. Yeah, 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 10 elements. I, I know when we brought the five, I heard about maybe seven. But, but ten, I didn't, I didn't know about that. So with saying that, uh, you guys, I know to fair, you mentioned that um, there's a difference between hip hop and rap. Rap's a part of hip hop, but it's not the totality of hip hop. Why do you all think that you know now? I guess maybe starting back when the DJ was dropped off the rap groups, uh, instead of saying DJ is and the MC, it just became an MC. Uh, why do you think there's been a strong emphasis on the rap aspect? Or that, or that one aspect of hip hop. I'll start. I'm sure I'll have something to say. I think about um, people like Chuck D saying how in the mid, or like, well, no, before that, I guess. Chuck D and others in the late 70s and very early 80s saying they couldn't even conceive of how hip hop could exist without all the other elements. Like this idea that you could isolate a rapper and that that would become its own thing and become a life of own was something that the people there at the beginning couldn't even wrap their heads around because it was such a communal thing 
Um, so that's just sort of a, a place to start. Clearly, Piper, and you I have out. more to say. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's speech is a dominant cultural form, and it's also the easiest to commodify. Yes. We like individual speakers, just like band members, baby to the back, and singers right up there. Um, you know, happened to Motown, you know? So I think that because it's not as easy to commodify and make public the, the visual art and the dance moves that were so localized that how do you make money off of that? And rap is a commercial industry, right? That the record companies just prey on. Um, it, there wasn't, you know, flat home labels right at the beginning, right? It, Sugar Hill is decidedly compromised. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. um, there, there, it was a white thing. Um, and it was a, a lucrative. And they also not only you know made the money, but they engineered kind of the the narrative of right. what it was gonna look like. And you know, hot hip hop lives here at 95, whatever. <laughs> um, so it had nothing to do with what they're talking about as cultural life and the way you were raised. I, I wasn't raised on that. I was raised on Merle Haggard. I'm the son of a daughter of an uh, So I had to learn it and try really hard not to expropriate it and love it because it's a black cultural form. Yeah, I'm so confused. Yeah, I was going ahead of it for a second. Though. That was what I was going with what Kelly was saying. So the ease of commercialization, we have a lot to do with it. Just that now we have these distinctions between hip hop and rap. Okay, okay, you might touch what I'm going to touch. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we've been, we, we did see this with disco. Do you remember that? We saw it. Remember the disco? Remember disco had the bands. Remember the 10, 15, 17 piece bands? And then um, remember in the 70s, they did all the fusion music, and it was like salsa bands that were mixing with these soul bands, and they were, it was, you know, Phenomenal, and then these record execs were like, "Oh, you know, we just need that one cute chick uh, put on this little outfit and sing, and uh, she'll sing it, <laughs> but uh, you're gonna be in the video." They started that with disco. Also, too, remember in the '80s, you have the uh, the infusion of electronic the electronic um, instruments, and so with the music business, that was a business. To, to sell these instruments. Um, we could go into a whole other history about how black people actually helped revolutionize those instruments or even create or invent those instruments. But um, it was cheaper because now uh, you just, instead of these, you know, 12 guys that you got to pack up all their gear, get them on a bus or a plane, feed them, you know, they all got to get the per diem their money, blah, 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 it's one guy. And we can even argue about that one guy not even making what he needs off of his shows nowadays, or his merchandise, or his image, right? And so it's 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 the commodification, but it's, it's even worse than that. <laughs> because now you can also isolate that person and make that person even say your ideas. It, and it's an easier way to sell ideas. If you think about it, because if I isolate you and you're in a 360 deal and you basically, you know, I don't know another way to say it, you know, living off the deep of the record, the record industry, then, and you don't know what's going on, you don't understand what's happening, then you're kind of there by yourself. You want to make it, you want to live, you want to, you, you've been sold this idea about fame and fortune and the whole thing, which is not the hip hop culture, right? And so it, it's, it's a separation from it. Anyway, that I'll go down the rabbit hole with y'all with that, but those, those are just some of the things I think about. Yeah, thank you, Piper, because you made this easier for me. But it, it's, um, it, it is, I mean, you made a wonderful point. It's the technology, means, of course, the expenses associated with you know, put, put together a record and going on tour, of course, those expenses are then significantly cut if you get rid of the stage show, right? Especially dancers and then, of course, DJs. Some rappers have multiple DJs. I think it was a, it's a combination of two things. It was, of course, technology. Back then, you had to remember when hip hop started, they rapped over what? Records. So the DJ was absolutely necessary. But when, uh, like, Sister made a brilliant point. 
when they when they created the 808, the 505, the 606, when they created the beat machine, then that was the start of the DJ not being as necessary as as it comes as as it pertains to the actual production and creation of a hip hop song or rap song. So along with technology, like with everything else, like the robots in our manufacturing facilities, you no know, longer need people because now we got robots who can spray and paint vehicles, right? Same thing with hip hop. It affected hip hop as well because the, uh, the DJs weren't as necessary. Thankfully, because we have so much content, DJs have been able to find another way by which they can make a living. And then the other part of it, so once the, um, the technology became so dominant in, in, in the rap game, you then now have people who don't, young people who really don't even know the DJ. Right. They don't really even understand this history. They don't really even understand the importance of it. They wouldn't even know how to use a DJ, right? right? A lot of these newer rappers. So it's gotten to the point we've progressed so fastly and we have allowed the DJ to be removed, just like the break dancers, to be removed from well, break dancing to now. Sisters, you know, doing something else on this dance floor, right? Which I have a profound disdain for because that's clearly misogyny. You're taking essentially the strip club, and I understand why sisters get into that, why sisters do that. I really understand that. But then now they've integrated that culture into hip hop culture, so we went from break dancing to that reality, right? But then that's being pushed back against because there's other, there's guys also doing, you see Lil Nine Sex, you know what I'm saying? You see what he's doing now, right? So I'm not. Not get necessarily none of it. I'm saying that the culture is changed, and we have to continue to challenge it and, and push it. You know, because when folks who don't have the best interest of African people at heart, they're going to promote the aspects of culture that don't represent the best of us. That's always going to be the case. But we can't get caught up into that and begin to attack our brothers and sisters who are trying to make a living and don't necessarily have to understand that we have to love on them expose this history to them, expose these other realities, these other possibilities to them, and encourage them to represent the best of themselves, whatever that looks like for them, with this new information that we should be challenged to give them, right? You know, so I think hip hop has to be really careful. It has been bastardized to an extent, right? It has been exploited. It has been extorted, right? It has been watered down. It's been stripped down to bare bones. When you look at what it once was, especially the rap element of it, the rap element of it. I think it's just radically different. I think we have to be really, really careful and, and, and maintain and hold on to those rich cultural beginnings that hope really form uh, the culture of hip hop and especially rap music. I'm so happy about the brother, Sister Piper. I can't, even, I don't remember his name, the brother who started the, uh, who created the mini turntable. What's the brother? Dane Dash was here. It's a brother from Detroit. Oh. He created a mini turntable. It's like a mini, you can carry it in your hand. Look at mini turntables. But in Detroit, um, I had to look it up. Maybe look it up on our, on our phones when we come back to it. So this brother is trying to retain some of our rich cultural beginnings in the hip hop music. And I'm very, very happy to see that. I'm happy to see Dane Dash and Freeway got on board. And they're promoting this brother from Detroit who has this mini, you know, uh, this mini, uh, this mini uh, turntable. But yeah, we just have to be really careful. We have to always exercise Sankofa, remember the source, and understand why why hip hop was created in that particular way, and always keep that integrated in what we do moving forward, so we can honor you know the, the foundations laid by our ancestors. All right, thank you. When we you know as you guys spoke about just over the fifty years of hip hop, how it's progressed, how it's changed, how it's um, uh, evolved in certain aspects. Uh, in all those different iterations of hip hop, in what ways have hip hop championed issues of social justice? Uh, so um, I have a I have a couple podcasts, but one podcast I have is on Black Power Media, and we uh, <laughs> one of one of my sort of mentors there. Dr. Jared Ball, who does media studies, he always says that he always says that we give too much credit <laughs> to hip hop for uh, being the social justice. Um, uh, what would I say? Like, like being this catalyst for social justice. I do push back against that a little bit, though, <laughs> um, uh, because of the cultural 
aspect that we talk about when we talk about hip hop, right? Because I would argue that the very creation of hip hop itself is more a radical pushback to what was happening to people in neighborhoods. That Cindy, who was Quayhurk's sister, created a party, you know, in the Bronx on Central Ave. Um, was the content <laughs> of the party revolutionary? Perhaps not. It probably was just a party. And she says she just wanted to make some money. And but I would even I would say that even the idea of them plugging into the street life, if you know the history, um, and that was revolutionary, right? Because people uh, didn't have access the way we do now, like you can just buy the little speaker over there at Target and hook your phone up. You know, it was uh, <laughs> it was very difficult to have access to uh, audio visual uh, materials back then, right? Even having speakers was like expensive, right? Having a record player was expensive. But we were talking like the 70s, right? And so I would argue that even just the idea of, of, of being and, and doing something just because is a revolutionary act in a country that does not respect Black life, right? So I would argue that now, the content of the music has not always been revolutionary, however, there have been artists who have given us some revolutionary music, who have given us some inspirational music, who have given us some music to have us believe in ourselves and have black pride, who have, who I would even argue that them having samples of people like a James Brown um, and even some of the samples in their music, Nina Simone and others, uh, introduced those artists to the different generation. So I think um, in thinking about the question, I don't think I would have relegated just to like revolutionary lyrics per se. I would include revolutionary lyrics within my definition. Um, and then we have, you know, a whole era that uh, what we lovingly look to is the good old days <laughs> where uh, we had a lot of so-called revolutionary content, right? Um, maybe it was the late 80s, perhaps. And so, um, anyway, I'll land the plane there. Something to think about. I don't want to say that, like, that's definitive. Like, we can continue to debate about that. Well, just uh, uh, two quick things. One, one thing I was talking about the early days, I think of uh, Trisha Rose, who wrote the, one of the first academic books on hip hop called Black Noise. She talks about even graffiti writers, right? Like this idea of like, you know, writing on trains because the trains would take their tags and their names and their you know identities places where they couldn't go, where the black and brown bodies couldn't go, right? Uptown, certain parts of Manhattan. So, so that's what I think of when you say that. And then in terms of like revolutionary music, yes, I talked about the eighties, but also she sort of under sort of. Evaluate what she has done, like our book, which you know I won't because you're spend too much time on, but documents the revolutionary hip hop that women in Detroit, you know, have been making for the past couple of decades. Um, tracks like we worked with Piper and uh, Nick Love Rose and Mahogany Jones on. Um, they create a track called like. There's tons of one example is a song called Legendary. Right? We just gave them an idea for a conference, an academic conference. We're like, this conference is wondering if maybe we want to do something. Just what was it a place, space, and place, identity? Space, and, identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they created a track, and Piper made a video for it, and we got to take this to a conference, and they got interviewed, and you know, interviews are out there now. And, and using hip hop here, um, like um, Paul mentioned, like D Essence, do you hear D Essence? Smith, who some of you in this room probably know, uh, who does work on some of her layers for environmental justice, right? There's so many different ways that people are locally using hip hop as a, as a tool, as a voice to be part of conversations. 
that they have historically been left out of. Maybe Kelly wants to say something more about that. I first want to say that it depends on what kind of hip hop, right? Mm -hmm. So commercial hip hop is not going to give you revolution. Anything that's based on profit mm -hmm. is like watching TV and hoping to find justice. Sure. It, it's not where you're going to find it. Um, so there's, but if you do listen, like when I listen to TI, I learn a lot about the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. like when I listen to Nas, or when I listen to Tupac, or when I, there, you can learn the lessons. But it's what does communities do that that gives hip hop a life, a life of change. And if, if you know anything about Detroit Summer, those kids are hip hop heads. They have a, a, a Detroit Summer hip hop song. Every Their whole lives were hip hop. They're Detroiters, why could they not be? And so they're in a social justice organization and hip hop is the way they, they make the map and build the bridge. And Piper did the same thing. She, I remember when we first met Piper, she had just, early into the iteration, she had been to, is it the Chicago Freedom School? Remember, you and Bryce went, and she's like, we learned all this language of oppression. We never talked about intersectionality. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, now we have this so whole long language, right? And so this language, it needed to come the hell out of academia and get put to work, because you are intersectional. That's what hip-hop is intersectional, it's an inter-element, all-culture thing. And that's what she created. She created a space that wasn't just women in hip-hop. There was some of the best beat makers, some of the best DJs that are men that supported it and collaborated, and some of the ciphers that happened there were just genius. Um, and, and there was an epic of uh, what Piper would do. She would have videos all the time, videos of women in hip hop all over the place. In addition to Dilla and everybody else that makes Detroit, Detroit, there was women, you know, the, the first MCs here that we've forgotten all over the gallery. So you felt it when you walked in. You breathed it and you ate it. It wasn't any idea, it was a practice. And that's what hip hop is in social justice, is when it's a practice of community building and not not just something that's for profit. Yeah, so um I think when you when you if, if we consider Gil Scott Herring, mm -hmm. right, and the last poets to be uh, the foundation of hip hop, I mean, it's really inarguable. Mm -hmm. Right. So the question becomes, right, uh, has hip hop or has rap has does has it did it historically initiate a black liberation struggle or did black liberation struggle create artists who were connected to it who used their gifts to address the issues that were plaguing in the black community yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you understand right so like i said it's, it's just so important that we don't ever allow hip-hop culture to overshadow the overall black uh, black culture right Black liberation struggle was born out of the conditions African people were forced in, and, and, and inherently, as any uh, sane human being would do, we resist it. We resist it, oppression. So you have artists who come from the black community, they will then create art of resistance. Right. It's born out of our conditions as African people who demanded that our humanity be acknowledged and respected. Right? So this is when you see Gil Scott Harry. This is when you see don't push me cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then we get to, I got a letter from the president the other day. I opened and read it and said they were suckers. Who want to read for the army or whatever? Picture me giving a damn. I said never. Right? I'm see, you see this. Then you see KRS-1. Oh, no. That's the sign of the police. Woo, woo. That's the sign of the police. Right? Then my whole, our whole album was about liberation. Yeah. Right? It's just invincible liberation. Political consciousness at a high level. Right? Masterful lyricism. Right? Using her hegemony, using her position of privilege to speak to these issues and challenge the community from which she comes. Right? That's beautiful. Right? So I would argue that. As long as there's been music, there's always been music that reflected the conditions of our people and the struggles that we were in, right? I'm saying so, yes, a little bit of that, but I think really, again, hip hop and a politically conscious hip hop, social justice hip hop, was born out of social justice struggle and black liberation struggle specifically, right? We crafted in 2010, 2012, we wrote the Band of Box policy for the city of Detroit. We wrote it. 2010, for uh, 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 for city employment, 2012 for contractors who want to do business with the city, right? These are hip hop artists who helped write this with city council and got it passed unanimously right now, 
We are part of Stephanie Change. We help create the statewide coalition for police accountability and transparency. Right? I'm a rapper, right? I'm a hip hop guy, right? And I'm right in the middle of that. We help craft dozens of policies to address police accountability and transparency and the police brutality in our communities, right? I'm saying so, you know, uh, uh, hip hop in this state, in this city, I would argue more so than any other city. We have these debates nationally, which hip hop has been a part of. No one has done it like hip hop when it comes to uh, a conscious hip hop translating uh, into serious social struggle and even policy, not just protests and demonstration, but we have all been involved in serious policy work that changed the reality of black people in this city. You know what I'm saying? Look at Brother Daryl Woods. He comes up on hip hop. He's born out of hip hop. His reality is hip hop, right? And the streets, for sure, this brother directly wasn't directly was involved in the work with Justice Bernstein. Thank you, and Sister Abdullah, for coming in regards to juvenile lifers, right? That come out of the hip hop uh, community. That's hip hop culture. We are hip hop. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying so in Detroit, probably more so than anything else. We are in all of these spaces. When it comes to black liberation struggle in the city of Detroit, we represent and have taken power in all of these spaces. Daryl Woods, formerly incarcerated, was convicted for a crime he did not commit, did life, was sentenced to life in prison. Snyder let him go, right? Because the hand and mind of God touched him, let the brother go. He's the first formerly incarcerated person in the country appointed to the police commission. Mm -hmm. That's hip hop. That's hip hop in Detroit. The same brother, formerly incarcerated, sits on the state appellate board. When have you ever known an ex felon to be appointed to the state appellate board? Huh? I sit on the governor's black D supervisory council. I'm the chair of the state of the statewide safety and justice committee. I'm a rapper. You see what I'm saying? Ms. Barfield, oh, who had a rap group, people don't know Dr. O. Anderson used to rap. He had a rap group called EA Force. He and Ms. Barfield in the early 90s, they are, uh, uh, they are testifying in front of the Congressional Black Caucus, in front of the Senate and the House, about the ban on assault weapons. That's hip hop. Dr. O. Anderson was a rap artist. He was a poet. He had a rap group with an actual record. He is arguably the most brilliant political mind in this country. Who's the projects? Wayne State sit in, Wayne State graduate, University of Michigan graduate, Dr. O. Henderson. Just beat Penn State University. <laughs> so this is Detroit hip hop. We're different. We can't compare us to nobody else. We're different. Yeah, and I do also want to say, I uh, think about uh, the ways in which we can continue growing that, right? So, for instance, um, we were doing an event, we haven't done it since before COVID, uh, for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Oh, yeah. And so, when Detroit had the rape kits, uh, for a few years in a row, we what we did with our event was, you know, you come and you can hear a small panel discussion from people who are working to support survivors and things, and you also hear some music, some rappers, right? So because you lay something heavy like that on people, you gotta have a little bit of levity and mix it up. We would have some great food some healthy food and we would have like uh, an area for people to go and decompress in case they were not able to, you know, sit through it. We had an aspect that was for men because what we don't talk about is sexual assault against men uh, in our community and how rampant that is. And, and so men could feel safe to be with men to deal with that because in our hip hop uh, lyrics and culture, it's prevalent, but I don't think that we honor our men enough to allow them the space to be vulnerable enough because this is a problem in our communities. It's not just our women and our girls. It's our boys that are over-sexualized and things like that as well. And so we would have a space for that, right? Because that's all hip-hop to me, like you said, is like how are we shifting culture around our culture 
And we would have the petition there to, we had when uh, we had something like 16,000 rape kits. The rape kits were something like $1,500 to get processed, which was ridiculous, which is why they were sitting there from the 70s because they didn't have the money to process them. And so we got the policy, like you said, change, and we got it lowered down to like 400 bucks. And we're like, wow, that's still a lot of money. But that's how it got down to 11,000. And then, you know, and, and we had people sign, right? So you come and hang out, you get a get a meal, right? Uh, uh, you know, some, not a lecture, but some food <laughs> for thought. And you sign this petition, we turn that in, and now we're getting these rape kits tested, right? And we got more and more, so they got boiled down. We're still not where we need to be, but we got a lot of them done. There's still a lot of work more to go, but do some of those, some people who have been out here, um, you know, I'm an abolitionist, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm conflicted about people being boxed up, but in this current system that we're in, we don't have an alternative, and what we can't have is people continuing to harm, cause harm, right? And so with that, some people went in, but also it allowed people who have been accused to, to get out, people who have been boxed in to get out. So hip hop can be a catalyst for social change. It, can, it has been and it can be um, for shifting ideas as well. So just like when I was, I don't know, where was I, 11th grade, when Karis once said about being vegan, right? No meat, no burger is suicide, self-murder. But I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a vegan. When I went to college, when I turned 18, I went to Howard University, guess what? I became vegan. I called my family, they thought I was crazy. Oh, like, what you doing? I said, I don't eat meat anymore, because guess what? For that whole year and a half, I was like, watch when I get out of here, I'm gonna be vegan. And 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 the kids are impressionable. I was impressed by what Karis once said in a hip hop song that had me become vegan. That might sound crazy or trivial or trite, but you'd be surprised culturally what's going on in our neighborhoods and communities, our homes and our streets because of the influence right. of hip hop. Nice. And just like it can influence us to want to be gangsters and killers and thugs and all of that, it can also influence us to want to be scientists and doctors and all types of stuff. So. Yeah, I commend you because it was very hard back then, right? It wasn't no options at all, right? And, 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 I'm gonna, and, I'm, and, and I apologize, Sister Piper, and I want to hold up the sister who was working with Sister Piper. And in fact, Sister Kim Trey, we know, was one of the leaders in that space. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she actually, she actually, you know, she was a part of the city in at Wayne State, right? Sister Kim Trent, right? She comes from that, from that group of students, right? Then you also have, um, 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 I'm sorry, for those who don't know, can you tell them about the sit-in at Wayne State? Uh, that's when black students who fought for Africana Studies Department and the black student uh, curriculum, but mainly Africana Studies, students sat in and took over the uh, student center building, right? Yeah. Right, and uh, that was a big thing back in the late 80s, early 90s, the community rallied around them. There's, we can do a whole panel discussion on that, Dr. Droff. We probably need to do that, to revisit that moment, but it was a great, it was a great moment in Detroit history and you had a lot of rap artists, a lot of community leaders, community activists, you know, and a lot of folks who are in positions of political leadership who was involved in that. But Sister Kim Trent, and then also Sister Kalima Johnson, who's yeah. the founder of the Sasha Center. Yeah. Now, Sister Kalima, she used to be Ebony and her business. Yeah. Before Ebony and her Nikki business, D. she was on yeah. Nikki D. Yeah. Her and I shared a record label together. She started the first African American woman's uh, sexual assault healing institute in the world she's right now the premier voice for sexual assault victims in the nba in the nfl in the in, in, uh, in, in major league baseball right this is a sister she was a rap artist she was cold too to yeah. me at that time one of the best rap artists not just best female voices but one of the best rap artists in the city of detroit she's also a magnificent poet this yeah. is this is sister kalima johnson she's also one of the co-architects at least regionally for the new R. Kelly movement. Yeah. That's she was one who led the new R. Kelly work in Detroit. This again, this is hip hop. Yeah. 
You see what I'm saying? You know, she should, I mean, I would have gladly given my seat up for that sister because her work is just magnificent. Yeah. Right? So I'm saying Detroit, Detroit again, like my brother Carl Frazier does, it's different. He's a rapper. He comes out of New African People's Organization, Malcolm X, uh, Malcolm X Center, right? Hip hop artist who created, who helped create the uh, institution of the organ organization called Detroit, does it differently, right? Detroit is different, right? I'm saying that brother, he hip hop. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying so Detroit is unlike, because we do it differently, but unlike any other city in the country, even New York, even LA, no, none of them do it like us. Um, I heard um, Curtis mentioned a couple of times uh, about commercial hip hop and maybe more and more socially conscious hip hop. Um, I think it was, I read something in 2018 that said that hip hop was like the most streamed form of music, yeah. you know, worldwide. Uh, very commercially viable, makes a lot of money. Uh, I think uh, Yassine Bey, most deaf, he was just doing an interview and they asked him about Drake. And he was like, oh, you know, it's uh, Drake is it's commercial. He, I mean, I, it's like you say Walmart with an edge or something like that. So, <laughs> so it, it is um, the money making commercial hip hop, is it, uh, does it go against, um, is it, um, Deleterious to the social consciousness of hip hop, or can it coexist? Could it be redeemed? What, what do you think? Or is it something that that's bad for hip hop? So I would say um, first, uh, thanks for talking about Kalima and um, and Sasha Center and Kim Trent because like we that's a lot of work we do together. The the new R Kelly and all the you know all that work so shouts out to them. Um, I want to say that you have capitalism, and so the record industry, the the the, the music industrial complex, is a thing. And so there are, I, I can get into some way political stuff that I don't even know if U of M is ready for around, you know, the connections to uh, Israel and uh, how they are training our police and the militarization of our world and how we need to be militarized. Uh, there is no difference of what's happening in Palestine and what's happening in the Congo and what's happening in Haiti and what's happening in Sudan, and what's happening in the streets of Detroit, the murder rate that is increasing every second of our day in Chicago. There is no difference between the, uh, the, the capitalist structures that exist to basically oppress people and keep people as food in that system, right? That's a whole thing, right? There's a whole conspiracy theory which Maybe it's not a theory around why there are so many guns mentioned uh, and the ways in which Smith & Wesson is a part of funding. And we can look to all the funding of all these record labels, right? Uh, when a lot of these rappers go into their deals, they're already set up and there's all these corporations that are already linked to the record business, which holds it up, because we know that the record business has not actually sold a record in probably 20 plus years. And we already know that streaming does not make money. But we also know that there are streaming farms that we see if you go on Instagram in uh, various countries around the world, particularly Asian countries, where they, they have whole streaming farms where all they're doing is set up hundreds of phones in a room that looks like this and stream, 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 just to get those streaming numbers up. Before that, the record labels were going and selling and, and, and stealing basically their own records and hiding them in warehouses and claiming that they were selling these records. That's a whole other conversation about the nefariousness of the record business. We haven't even mentioned the link to the mafia and what destroyed Barry Gordy and Motown. That's a whole other podcast series. But I'll just say this, that we, we do keep saying there is a difference between the music industrial complex or the record business and hip hop culture. So with that, um, I will say that 
Yes, we can distinguish because there are plenty of artists all around the world who have fans, who tour, who sell merchandise, who are in business as a musician, as a hip hop artist, and no one here knows their name. Right, and they're touring all over the world. And they, if you go on their social media, they have hundreds of thousands of followers because people follow their music and they know how to be in business outside of that, the constraints of that particular system. So I think it's important for us to continue to criticize and critique that system as we as we move away from that system. Again, I'm an abolitionist. I don't believe in any of these systems, but um, I yield. Okay. Yeah, the commercialization of hip hop. Um, is it redeemable? Is it bad for hip hop? This is going to sound like a strange analogy, but maybe I won't do this analogy then. I think this, everything that Piper said um, and everything about capitalism is at work in, a, in this industry, and I think that it's abusive at the same time to take that music away that came from that commercial industry, if we couldn't find it in another form, or like you were you were citing people that didn't come from the underground and stay there. Um, so it's, to me, it's not even like commercial hip hop and conscious, it's what happens in the underground that doesn't happen in commercial hip hop, because you're not constrained in the same way. Like you don't get the money, right? So for me to say that capitalism is bad and hip hop shouldn't, would be to disadvantage all those people that came up because of hip hop. So I don't want to take away anybody's economic ability but I want to change the structures of how it's done. Uh, so there's accountability and so like you're not going to get equity from a corporation, but uh, the commercial industry ruined artists. There's artists here that should have blown up, that weren't willing to conform to what they wanted that artist to be at a certain time. And so now they're, they go to Africa, they go to Germany, they go to France. That's where they get their love because the music industry won't pay them because they don't fit the bill. Right? Try to put Invincible on an album with a corporation and see how that goes. Yeah, no, no oppressive system is going to promote an instrument that directly challenges and is created and designed to overthrow that very system of oppression. Right? You know, so um, and that's an excellent point, right? Invincible is dope. She should yeah. be a billionaire, you know, it's yeah. based upon pure skills. Yeah. But we know that the uh, we know that uh, the record company was very intense. The record industry was very intentional. The corporate record industry was very intentional about destroying, and that's really what they did, destroying um, the following and the exposure, the commercial exposure of positive hip hop. One of the reasons why I'm conscious hip hop, one of the reasons why Public Enemy was known is because even though they were political, right, they were still played on the radio. People forget that. Terrence One was played on the radio. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they were very, I mean, X Clan was played on the radio, right? But you don't hear any very little positive hip hop. Every once in a while, we can sneak something through, like, gee, just walk, right? Every, every once in a while, we can sneak a positive, conscious, inspiring song through. Like, even the stuff that Little Dirk is doing with J. Cole right now with the babies, right? Talking with the children, you know, singing, you know, behind it. Uh, you know, so you can still you can still hear some positive stuff, but it's not, especially stuff that's challenging the status quo or challenging political systems or challenging any of these systems of oppression, especially as it pertains to you know African people in this country. Uh, you don't hear any of that stuff commercially. Now, let me say this though: on YouTube, social media, on the internet, our people are so brilliant. They have, they're creating their own following and they're making a living off their own following, although you don't know who any of these artists are, right? You don't know who their moral technique is. You don't know any of these people, but these folks have millions of followers and they're actually having shows all over the country and all over the world, and they're living quite well. But they're making money off shows, not off sales, because I don't think they figured out or they're not exposing it anyway how to make money off the screen. So I wish back then we had access to social media. We had MySpace when we came to the middle, right? <laughs> right? But I wish we had access to social media. I'm convinced we would have blown up, especially to the point that we could have took care of ourselves. Like many artists right now, you got millionaires. You wouldn't believe how much money these artists are getting just by creating their own following through social media 
and have an underground show and having shows all over the country. You heard Cat William talk about it, right? One of the things that he said that I thought was true, a lot of stuff I had issues with, but one of the things that he said that I thought was, was right is that he does he does a hundred city, he does a hundred city tours every year. But even though he is people know who he is, he's not as commercial as Kevin Hart and Steve Harvey and some of the others, but he's doing really well because he has his own sort of like cult following, if you may. There are people in this country who don't follow Cat Williams because they're Cat Williams supporters and fans. Whether he achieves uh, the high level of commercial success that some of the other uh, artists uh, have received or not, he has created his own following. That's the beauty of social media, right? I'm saying so while yes, on the commercial end, you know, we are not as exposed of uh, what rappers are still doing it on the social media and on the underground and doing really, really, really well. Some of these cats are being there. So just to speak to that too, um, my current work is kind of looking at this, so thanks for the tie-in. There's also a lot of people in the city, because of social media and other things, who figured out how they can just live off their art, right? right? So they don't need to be millionaires. They're like, the new sort of thinking is, hey, if I can do what I want to do and make like a hundred grand a year, two hundred thousand dollars a year doing this, then great, right? Save me from going out and getting, you know, a job that maybe I'm not passionate about. So you do have newer, younger um, organizations and entities in Detroit. Um, you have things like digital media companies that are owned by um, you know, a handful of young African-American well, youth called uh, Menace Media is one of them. You have an online digital distribution platform that's an alternative to Spotify called crowd freak right you have uh, organizations that have come since uh where piper's done like we are culture creators who are training uh youth of color in the city in the media arts right who aren't going to school for this so here's some other places you can do this they're being really innovative they're teaming up with uh entities like the detroit pistons Kit Kat gave them a bunch of money in the summer and made a little documentary about what they're doing in the southwest they put on the website for the world to see so younger artists uh, who are working in the space of hip hop here are really doing extraordinary things and finding ways right, are really dedicated to how can we, you know, how can we create this local hip hop economy that's basically vertically integrated from the top down and almost exclusively black owned from making the music from where and how we're distributing the music to the venues the, that these people are performing at to the online um, social media marketing teams that are working with and then um, like performances shot giant events that they're putting on in this city that thousands of people are, are attending so it's been extraordinary for me to just watch this over the last few years uh, like a lot of people on here said, it might not be people a lot of us in this room know, but they're like, I'm making a living doing this, and it's allowing me to stay in the city, to not have to go to LA or to New York, so I can invest in my city, like buy a house in the city. Sometimes it even ends up a big hit. Like Curtis Roach made that song, Board in the House, a few years ago, put it on TikTok, and then uh, Tiga said, hey, I really like it, let's do a collab. So he got a verse on there, and then Curtis Roach and interviews I said use that money to buy his parents a house here and he's still here making the music. So these are some things that I think are really extraordinary that are happening here right now. All right and so what we want to do right now is to segue to some audience questions. There's been a few questions brewing and so um, yeah if you have a question uh, yeah just raise your hand out come out there and you can ask me Hello, thank you everyone. I really enjoyed the panel discussion. I just wanted to bring up something that I need to think needs to be said. Um, Tafari did congratulate uh, Justice Bernstein on his work with juvenile justice. I see he's left out me to the laboratory and didn't want to say something to him personally. Um, I think that I personally was disappointed but I have to say I was appalled, that's more of the word, 
I, along with many others, when the Michigan Supreme Court decided to dismiss all charges against uh, the perpetrators of the Flint water crisis. Um, you know, that thing went on for years and years. People have suffered. People died. Over 100 people died. Uh, folks are struggling still and they will be struggling for the rest of their lives and for it to be just dismissed uh, in the way that it was, it was just really, really, really appalling. Um, and I think it lines up perfectly with what uh, Michelle Alexander talked about when she said power and the power structure sees certain groups as disposable. Thank you. Did you have a question? Grace and peace. So my big brother knows that I'm about to come with something that's a little uh, from our school of thought. So to all of my colleagues in higher ed and academia, please have tough skin with this. This, this is the word I made up. Have we now over academicalized hip hop and the rap culture? Because now I think we're devalidating some of the younger folks and some of the artists who have come. You have named several that folks that would never, they are in higher ed and those who validate the music, maybe not the culture, but they lift them up. Does that, does it look like that it pushes away the authenticness of our art, of the culture, of the music? So I'll leave that for any of the four. So, well, two quick things. One, I just, so Mama Soul from Flint, I don't know if you know Mama Soul. No. Okay, so Mama Soul had a lot of music, uh, or has, you know, because music still exists, about that. Also, we have an artist, her name is Cover Girl. She um, did a song about um, living, you know, through the uh, Flint water crisis, and she addressed it to Governor Snyder, is a whole thing. So we do have, we, we did create a lot of music during that time because I'm, of one of the so-called water warriors. And I too weep and lament and I'm very sad about what has happened and the way that has Snyder got away with murder, literally. And so we do need to do maybe some more work in that, make more songs since then. But we did a lot of events at that time to raise awareness about the Flint water crisis. We raised a lot of money. We went we, we, we did a lot of work, like, you know, bridging the gap between Flint and Detroit to um, raise, like, again, like, raise money with folks in Flint, led by them, and get supplies and, and the whole thing. So um, that's a continued struggle because Flint is not fixed. And um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done there. So thank you for lifting that up. That's something that hip hop can lead more into. And then as far as your question about the over, I don't think it's a battle between like academia and like something else, but I do, I do want to say this. I understand what you're saying. Like there's a lot of academia that is like making money off of hip hop. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. Like I know that like Ninth Wonder and some other people have had classes at Harvard and Harvard has a, had a whole hip hop program. I know a lot of these universities have, you know, hip hop studies U of M. I have been in Stevens class teaching about women in hip hop history. It has a whole hip hop history curriculum that sits inside of Africana studies. I do think it's necessary to have hip hop in the academic space, especially under Africana studies, black history, history. I think it's necessary because, um, and I don't, this might sound weird, but I don't necessarily think that all knowledge needs to come from Jake the Wino to our youth, if that makes sense. Not invalidating Jake the Wino, because he got some knowledge that needs to be given. So I don't think, I just don't see it as a binary. Like, I don't see it as an either or. I feel like those white kids that I've encountered in university need to learn about the history of black culture and they need to learn that black history is their history 
and so do the white kids that are there. I think is I think that part is very important. Um, now, the commodification, how do we fix that? That might be a different conversation. Um, but I don't say that. I, I wouldn't say it shouldn't be there. Maybe the who's teaching it, what's the curriculum, you know, what's being said, how things are being framed, those are all important. Um, anyway, I, I'll land the plane, I'll yield. Of the points fiber, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> white youth make up so much of the consumers of so many aspects of hip hop, um, and they don't know the history, and they don't know any. A lot of them don't know anything other than, you know, Drake and Little Wayne, and um, maybe some of these SoundCloud rappers, right? So, for some, going back to an earlier question about the mainstream and you know more social justice oriented work, I feel like that mainstream stuff is often like the gateway, right? So they get into that and they listen to that. And some of those people then do have an ear open to maybe some other things and artists they haven't heard of. And it can be, I mean, I've taught some of this, so when Kelly teaches a whole class on it, it can be a jumping off point to get them you know, somewhere else and to see different perspectives or to see the value and digging for and uh, maybe trying to give other artists to listen. And there is a, a light, there's a spark that goes on when they're able to connect some of this music to some of these other issues that they might not have experienced or know about personally. So for me, that's where some of the, I guess the, the validation and the, the joy in what we do uh, rests. I just have a quick response because I really appreciate the question. Yes, I think it sometimes, I, I, I'm not, denying what Piper said about we don't want certain people being the kids. Some hip hop is so hard to read that you would think that Socrates wrote it. <laughs> uh, it's so theoretical and removed from community that it's like, why, right? I mean, the literature, the, the scholarship lead literature. So yeah, there's some hip hop scholarship that is so removed from hip hop that it's not recognized. So as a white woman who teaches a class called Hip Hop Race in the City, I won't do it unless I, I, I get no support from the university. I won't do it unless I can bring at least 10 artists in and I pay them out of my pocket because they need to know that this comes from a community. This comes from uh, a, a whole world that's bigger than hip hop and it's very much about hip hop as well because that's the only way they learn aesthetics. If you go read academics about hip hop, they don't write about aesthetics. They write about social justice things and they'll write about rhymes. Very, not enough, unless you go to sound studies, there's not enough analysis of the music per se and from where in, in its natural relationship to place. So I think that a lot of hip hops, and I'm, you know, and another thing about studying hip hop is you tell people you're a hip hop scholar and watch how fast they'll laugh because they don't take hip hop seriously. Hip hop is an intellectual discourse. This is it's one of the things that I've learned so much from Piper is like, I came looking for a certain kind of hip hop in Detroit and had to make it because it was intellectual training in New York to be just, you, you learn the world from rhyming, right? And so, you have to bring hip hop into the classroom if you're going to teach it. It can't just be a nasally ethereal theory thing. I don't know if that was what you were after, but it's definitely what's in my heart. Oh, I don't know if that's oh, we got another question. Okay. Oh, so a few questions. First off, I, you know, I just didn't wait for just a second, but was there a question, or, or um, I'd love to discuss it, was there an issue about the Supreme Court? Is what, Water keys. Yes. 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 Okay. Can someone? I have to address. No, we didn't have a question, but the beautiful sister in the audience did. Okay. This. this she this, said she was disappointed in the verdict handed down by the Supreme Court justice relative to. Uh, her, but I said the strong word was Paul. Okay. For which? Which? This is Flint Water. Yes. But for which? Because there were a number of Flint Water cases. So which? Well, which case? Well, the of all of the perpetrators of the Flint Water crisis. Got it. Okay, very understandable, and I can see why you know you feel that way. The, the reason that happened. Would you guys like to, to know the, the reason? Yeah, yes. Okay, yes. I, I, I question. Sure. Okay. okay, so so if I can answer the question, the reason that happened was because ultimately what occurred was it was a procedural issue. Okay, and what happened was that the government used a one man grand jury, and the reason that that's a problem is because the last thing you really want 
is for that to be a key thing where, where you're going to be using one main grand jury. Why do we, you know, when you look at the founders, the whole idea of the grand jury is, is that it's supposed to be the citizens that indict, not the government. So what happened was they used a one-man grand jury, which is very unusual. And number two, it was a judge. It was a member, it wasn't an independent citizen. So for that case, I can understand why people would be very upset. But the problem is, if you allow it for that case, you're going to have a huge issue across the entire criminal justice system, right? Because you, you can't pick and choose. If the government chose to use that form of a grand jury for that case, if you say that that's okay, then basically what you're going to have across criminal justice is one man grand juries, and that's not acceptable. So this is just the challenge of being a judge and challenge on being on the Supreme Court is, is that you look at a situation like that and you realize how upsetting it is, but then you think about all the things that we're talking about here today. And then you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, it's, that's just going to create an assembly line where ultimately folks are going to get indicted very quickly and it's too efficient of a model for the government to use to indict people and allow them to basically just get processed quickly. You've got to, be, indictments have to mean something. You can't just sit there and go to one person who happens to be a judge and ask for an indictment. You're supposed to have a grand jury. And if you can't have a grand jury that does it accurately and the citizens are required to be on the grand jury because the whole idea is it's supposed to be an independent component. It's not supposed to be the government that indicts you, it's supposed to be the citizens that indict you. And if it's not the citizens and it's a judge, it's a member of the government, that really goes against the constitutional fabric of why we were created and why we left England. But Justice Bernstein, yes. the one-man grand jury wasn't just created for the Flint water crisis. It, there are several precedents for where it's been used over and over and, and over again. And so we and said- it's not illegal to use that. But now it is. Because you all did exactly. it for this case. But that was the problem was for that this we, case. No, you're absolutely right. But the problem was we hadn't gotten any cases prior to this that allowed for us to do it, right? Like it just, this was the case, unfortunately, where this was a, a, a choice that was made and something that was done. So this is the case that came to us that allowed for us to act on it. I but, understand, but it's been used over and over and over again. And for this case, you all use it to dismiss the charges against all of the people who were involved in the Flint water crisis. And so, I mean, I it seems like what she said, power, not feeling like a certain group, feeling like no, a certain group is disposable. Yeah, and so I think you're right. And I think how do you, how do you just get off? Okay, if it's a problem, then you say you can't use that and proceed with something else. But for everybody to just get off and people die, and there's many people who are struggling for life. It just but, doesn't but seem the, right. The government had the opportunity to come up with okay. charges and they uh, charges. <coughs> that's a question. And, and then the other part of that is that's true. Like it for me, the, the other part of that is as a community, what do we do from an organizational standpoint to to, to challenge that before right. it even hit the Supreme Court? Yeah. Right? I mean, the, and this is what happens with us. We, we, we respond to the verdict, but we're not as robustly involved in the process. Well, that's because you think the verdict is going to come out wrong. Right? Yeah, but, but no, no, but we, we, have, we have to be analytical enough, right? And we have to be analytical enough to recognize the flaws in the process before it even gets to the Supreme Court. For instance, we organize work around challenging the Judicial Tenure Commission, right? And there what appears to us to be mistreatment of black judges, disparate treatment of black judges. But we understood early in that process that the Judicial Tenure Commission leader wanted to do his own internal audit, but we argued from the very beginning, no, it's gonna be an independent audit. Thank God that Justin Bernstein, right, and I mean the role, I've been on the other side of some decisions and some things with Justice Bernstein, but I think overall, he has done, uh, his decisions have been in the best interest of Michiganders, and especially of our people, right? No leader, no decision making, maker makes the right decision every single time. We have to look at their body of work and see what decisions do they make over a period of time. In regards to the, J, in regards to the JTC, in, excuse me, 
in regards to the JTC, where there are judges who are responsible for people living or dying, okay? We, this man, and so the Supreme Court made a decision to ensure that we had an independent investigation. That's critical to a whole bunch of brothers and sisters as the ones who are locked up. Well, I commended him for the work that he does that you yeah. see as good work. I commended him for that. But I see this as a huge problem, and I see it as a problem with all political parties wanting these uh, perpetrators to get off. I agree. I, I agree. I respect that. that. But, I wanna, but what I want to do, he's a, he's a hip-hop folks invited him here, and he came. Hmm. Right? And, no, hip-hop folk. Because of our relationships and our body of work, right, and, and because of what we've been able to do, right, that's the reason why we ask, we say, hey, we just let it know. We didn't even really ask. We said, hey, we're doing this. But the girl sent in the flyer and reached out. He said, hey, I want to come to that. You know what I mean? So I appreciate and respect. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean he shouldn't get challenged because that's why he's here. He knows that's going to come. I have an issue with that. You're challenging. But, but, no, I'm not challenging you. I'm, I'm telling the truth. I'm not challenging you, sister. I'm not challenging you, sister. I'm telling the truth about the other things that have taken place that have been in the best interest of my people. Well, we got, we got like, we got two questions. You don't want to accept this response. We got, we got. Accept it. You do have a couple more questions. Can I add just one point to this? Miss Smith. Yeah. Watch this. No, watch, no, watch this. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nassau office is ending its pursuit of criminal prosecution over the Flint water crisis after seven years of non-conviction uh, decision that came Tuesday. So it was the Attorney General who made uh, Dana Nassau who made the decision not to pursue the charges anymore. And, and I thank God, as a person who did 29 years in prison, condemned to die there, uh, wrongfully convicted. I am so glad that they ended the practice of uh, uh, one man grand jurors. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because it has been, it's been terrible. Uh, and unfortunately, it has not been litigated up to the Michigan Supreme Court. But when that court got that case, you know, just like Justice Bernstein, Kyra Bowden, who's a strong black sister, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And so many conscientious other justices who made that decision to end that vicious and racist practice in the state of Michigan, I thank God for that. But you know, you still uh, have uh, to try. Can you, uh, uh, you yeah. run grand grand jury? You still well, have to try. Yeah, yeah, but, that's not and, this, this, uh, yeah, we can stay open talking about this. Let me just say one thing. This is hip hop. This is all the battle. This is all the battle. And I don't want us to run into the next question because of the battle, right? And the battle point that I think was missed, something I think that I, that I heard that I think was missed, is number one, the system is. Flawed. Okay. And so, and you know, so that's a thing. And then, um, I think the, the, that's a that's a thing, right? So that's so that's a thing all by itself. Within that, another thing that I think I heard was that um, something we could do is to be involved in the processes, and that's something that. We don't want to do because if you like me, most of the people in my community don't want nothing to do with their court or they want to go if, if, or any of that. It doesn't matter if it's the girl's help or if it's the girl's support because if the way the system has come after our people, we don't want to participate. And so I don't want to criminalize or condemn our people who are not even willing to participate in the system the way it's oppressed us. We're in an election year, this year, and things are going to get. You thought that the puppy and show might win the Easter. Wait until the 2024 election in November. Okay? And so these are some spaces that, you know, the primary, thank you, for the primary. So, you know, um, these are some spaces where we can, you know, be gangster, if you will. Like, you know, get involved and turn them out. Now, we, I personally don't even believe in the election process. I am not a Democrat or uh, any of that. However, I'm a community organizer. And as a community organizer, I understand that that's the only tool 
that I actually have nothing to do, but that is up to you. So I have been doing for the last, I don't know, eight years, uh, you know, uh, election, education, you know, political education, you know, getting my neighbors the way. I live in one of the most divested from communities in Detroit. We don't have anything. They, they go to our high school, our community center, we have the highest number of teenagers, we have the so-called, I don't even believe in the word crime, but we have one of the highest crime rates, lots of violence. I'm very involved. My neighbors think I'm that crazy lady that's knocking on the door, and I'll give you a flyer about divesting from the police, about yet keep your water on, about going forward, about all these things. And I'm the one that's going to sit there at your door and listen to you tell me how you don't believe in this and you're not about to vote. And I'm going to have a whole conversation with you like, but, but beloved, I know I don't believe in it either. But guess what? These people are going to be here and they're going to make decisions for us. And they're not going to think about us unless we have our foot on their neck. And so, that, so that's what I heard, I think, was accountability. Like, we, we have to also be accountable, right? And not... It's not accountable, like, you know, to condemn us. Right. And it's, it's, it's accountable, like, I don't understand what none of these laws say. When I go to city council, I do not understand what it says on the paper. But I got to take that, then I got to go read it, then I got to go learn something else so I can figure it out. Because it's, it's happening with or without me, with or without my involvement. And I already know that many of these people that are elected, they're elected because that's their job. And uh, you know, I don't have evidence that these people we've elected are there for my best interest over through emergency management or any of that. And so the only evidence that I have is that I know that when I go to my elected officials, I'm trying to make these relationships so that they still, even though they see me out there protesting against them, they still let me in their office, you know what I'm saying, on a private to have a conversation. And as far as the Flint water crisis thing, we still need to bang on them because it's not like we don't have any recourse. We still need to bang hard, and I don't mean physically. I'm talking about like, you know, make sure that we're holding people accountable because Governor Snyder got away with murder along with a whole bunch of other people. And we it is still our duty to like, you know, it, it feels too much. It feels like, you know, there's nothing we can do, but that's something hip hop can't do. We can definitely continue to do that. So I just want to affirm you, you know, and, and also, you know, just acknowledge, like, this system isn't made for us. Or rather, it is made for us, but it's made to oppress us. And I'm, uh, and I support you. I support you around the Fred water crisis work as one who was there from the very beginning, right? Organized by Arthur Wilson and others on the ground as one who helped bring 12 semis of water to Flint. I think that's still a record. Right, so I, 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 I'm all with that, and and, and, I, and I find it to be reprehensible as well. And like Sister Piper said, let's continue to organize, 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 organize. Because what I understand about them 100 beautiful brothers and sisters who lost their lives in Flint, we lose a black life every day in the city, and we on the front line fighting for those as well. Can I ask a very quick question? Just very quick, I really wanted to ask this question. The, the first one is, um. And again, don't say names or anything like that. Because, no, no, it, it's, it's actually important because I don't want to have any kind of um, refusal issues. But, okay. but I, I would like to, this is important. I, I, in the beginning of our discussion, someone had said that there was a, I just want to get a little bit, I'd like to get a little bit more. Someone had said that somebody was going to be going to jail for life. And I would just like, if you could, to kind of tell us a little bit more about that. And then, and then actually really quick. And then Piper, if you could, Share with us a little specifically. You said at the beginning of the conversation that you you lost your life savings. Yeah, I'd like to know again. And I, I want to be a little careful because I don't want to have to. I don't want to have to accuse if it comes up to us. But can you tell us? It, it, it just sounds like something I'd like to hear a little bit more about. So I'd like to hear about the person who's going to jail. I'd like to know that story about saying goodbye to someone who's leaving us forever. And the second thing is from Piper. I, I really would like to understand. What happened? How you lost this building? How you lost your life savings? Who took it from you? What is the building being used for uh, currently now? And what is your recourse to it? So, thank you. So, uh, I'll, so I mean, you, but you don't want me to name names? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
The, the first one is in is in a litigation. I think they go January twenty fifth. No, 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 no. The second one is dealing with you. <laughs> so, um, trigger warning. Is there anyone here that has any, um, you know? If it's not litigation, you can mention whatever you want. Like. This one is in litigation. Okay, then, then just be cautious. Okay. Yeah. Um. There is a rapper that was a part of the Detroit community who on this past Sunday uh, is accused of murdering his wife and stabbing her 17 times. His wife was a poet. <clears throat> it's, on, it's on social media, I've not named names. Um, and that is the long and short of it, but um, he is to be arraigned on the 25th, and I think on the February 1st is his sentencing, if I'm not mistaken, but... Um, no. <laughs> no, it ain't that it's not that quick, okay. No, no. <laughs> he, I, know, I know that he yeah, was yeah, running... Oh, uh, because he turned himself in, and... Um, but the arraignment is the 25th. Yeah, the arraignment is 25th. Okay. It'll be a couple of years before that case is really up. Okay, yeah. So it is torn a hole in our community, literally. I'm actually doing two podcasts on it because our entire hip hop community is silent. No one's saying anything because they are completely devastated by the entire situation. And so it's a mental health crisis um, in our community. Um, so that's one. Um, the second one, I don't know how to tell you without naming names. There's no litigation. So Phil Cooley uh, in Cork Town, who is, uh, I don't know, you know what I'm saying, I'm hip hop, I'm hip raw. But um, so Phil Cooley, who um, has a, a, a developed, his family has a development corporation in Corktown. We had, uh, had access to a, a building initially on Michigan Avenue where we were doing all this great work. And then um, someone wanted to buy that building. So he came to me and this is not hearsay. This is firsthand information. I'm telling you what happened to me. It was a conversation we had where he um, said, hey, since you're, you know, I have a whole building that you can that you can actually have, and um, you know, it's 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 in bad shape. But if you fix it up, and I told them, I don't know anything about buying property. I don't know how to fix the property. I'm looking for a property that's already together, so I don't have to do all that. I just want to do my work. And he said, No, if you get this property, then I will help you. It's documented in the Detroit News. We did a whole story. We signed the papers, we did a land contract, and we were purchasing the building. It was condemned. I learned later that it's illegal to sell a condemned building to people. I didn't know that, but I told them I didn't know anything about real estate. And so the, it was everything from the foundation had uh, water and flooding, if there was a whole foundation, the roof, and all of that. Fast forward, well, I, I had to find people to work on the building, and back then, it was a terror to try to go through the city of Detroit to try to figure out how to get anything done. And um, you're gonna talk about like the way the city of Detroit does business. All these people had people in their pockets and I didn't know anything about this corruption uh, that I was supposed to be giving people money under the table and that's the way to get stuff done. And I was like, I don't know nothing about that. You know, and they would come do an inspection and then tell me, that uh, it, that I got all these violations, and then come to find out, all I was supposed to do is slide some dude some money, and then I would have had no violation, which I never did. But um, we worked on these things. I worked on getting the foundation fixed. I worked on getting the roof fixed. A lot of money I invested into that labor. The whole I went, We were. I got the electricity uh, inspected like three, four times, the building inspected, inspected three, four times, the plumbing inspected three, four times. It was a whole hustle. Okay. Long story short, 
We were mostly completed with all of that, brought it up to code, was doing pro enough to do programming. Then they didn't like that. And so they start, they created a private police task force that was organized like a militarized police task force. I went to see, they came with their guns and I actually had guns to my head. And what do they, is it an AR-15 or I don't know what these police carry, but uh, they were in full right gear. They, they parked the police cars up to the front and to the back. They accused us of selling drugs, which we were not. We were doing youth programming and we were selling Fago and um, Better Made chips. And they were frisking people and it was a whole ordeal. And we had a whole computer lab, we had a whole restaurant, I mean, um, you know, food space set up for people to incubate their food businesses. We had mentorship program and we went to court so much against this. I kept complaining and Officer Henry is his name one day Told, walked in there and I, I was so traumatized because he told me we didn't deserve that building. There were people who told us we didn't deserve to have that. And I'm thinking I'm working every day, busting my hump to pay for this. And this was a whole situation. And come to find out the business association had put their money together. When I went to city council the six times to make to file my complaints, they did not have a record the, of the, this this entity existing, they never Mirandized me, so there's no record of their harassment. There's no record that they came there to do that. There is no record except for me and what I could the, remember from being traumatized and having a gun put to my head and trying to look at somebody's badge and hope they don't blow my brains away so I can move my eyes to see their eyes so they can see my humanity, so they don't kill me in this moment. And that happened six times when, as we were developing. Now, Quest Love has sent us some money because of Jessica Care More. It's a whole thing. I have a lot of documentation of things that I've written, but I complain and complain and complain and complain. And I was told, what police, we, there, there's no record of this down here. Come to find out they were hidden and private, and then come to find out they have been doing it to a whole bunch of spaces around the city, different galleries and things around the city. Uh, this was uh, 2010, 11, and 12. No, no, this was in Detroit, in Corktown, on Michigan Avenue, off of, between, off of 20th Street. Anyway, the building is still there. It is nothing. It is boarded up, and next to it is some garage that used to be there, and um, it's 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 completely a, a devastating situation. But um, yeah, that's that's uh, all in the thing there. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, what about Phil Cooley? I'm sorry that happened here. I just wanted to say that I'm happy that that they can have a conversation. My name is Deborah Bunkley. I'm with the Detroit League of Women Voters. I want to invite everyone here next Saturday because we're going to have the clerk, the city clerk, Janice Winfrey, and the uh, uh, chief operator, uh, Dan, Daniel Baxter, speaking at 10 o'clock. So you can come and ask questions. So we would like to invite uh, Chief Bernstein to be one of our speakers. Well, I just encourage everybody primaries. You know, you want to give the judges that work, vote. I don't care who you vote for, but you got to vote. You got to vote in the primaries and you got to vote in the general election. It's so easy now to do it. Three minutes to vote. And that's all I have to say. Oh, wait, just, just one thing to, to veggie back off that. Um, that's another area where we got to do a lot of work because these judges are in position and they, they have make a lot of decisions about our lives and we don't know who they are. And when the ballot comes up, and in my neighborhood, I know when people are looking at the ballot, and you know your friends are asking, "Who to vote for? Who to vote for?" I even don't know about judges. So that's something hip hop can do is keep records of these judges, the decisions they're making, and understand so that we understand when it's time for the ballot who we need to vote for, and those are campaigns that we need as well about our judges. That's something hip hop can do. So thanks for that. All right. All right, thank you all for coming out. This is actually our time.
thanks to our, to our panelists. We learned a lot today. Uh, you know, we, we had to start shutting down, but if you, you want to uh, mingle or run amongst yourselves, ask more questions, you can. And, uh, uh, let's give a panel in uh, my regular another round of applause. Thank you for that spirit of conversation. We appreciate you all joining us for our Martin Luther King Day at the University of Michigan Detroit Center. Uh, this coming Friday, we're hosting another event called Demystifying Detroit from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. here at the Detroit Center in Ann Arbor Room. We're going to be having uh, presenters. Uh, we're going to have Jamon, Bobby Jamon Jordan doing a short history of the city of Detroit. We're going to have Sea uh, Dad do a, a community engagement presentation about community development in the city and uh, community. Uh, Community benefits ordinances. We're going to have the uh, Chamber of Commerce do a, a presentation on the city of industry and what the economy of Detroit is like. And then uh, Data Driven Detroit is going to do a presentation called Detroit by the Numbers, a, a high level overview of the demographics of the city. So we go over to Detroit. It's from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. this coming Friday here at the Detroit Center. Good job, Chef. Thank you all. Appreciate you all for coming out. God bless you. Good night.